Heidi, why don't you tell us what the biggest pressure is for money managers when it comes to investing in their technology? Is it something about, is it, does it have to do with generating alpha? Is it, is it about keeping costs low or is it something else? Um, well, Rosenberg Equities has been really a pioneer in quant investing for over 30 years now. And it's really interesting to see this complete rise in interest in technology and new data sources and even a move, wholesale moves in some cases from fundamental to quantitative investing. Um, and that has myriad definitions. But I think the primary sources around that big push is coming, one, from uh, real pressure on fees. So firms need to find ways to be much more efficient and scalable in many of the activities that they do. I think secondly, it's been hard to add value as an active manager uh, given recent market environment, which has been quite positive for index funds. And so looking for new ideas or new sources of insight or, or added value, but also the computing power has, has really steadily increased over the past decade or so, probably even in the last five years. So technologies that were not as accessible five or 10 years ago are, are very accessible today. And would you, do you have in mind, aside from talent, which I've, of course talent is so crucial, what would you both say is the most important investment you've made in your technology for your firms? Culture. Culture. So, um, you know, I think when I hear people saying, oh, I just hired um, this fantastic uh, data science team or machine learning team um, at a firm that has no particular experience or expertise in data science or machine learning, I'm incredibly skeptical of it because most of the people that work in this area are firstly, firstly very overbid. There's a, a horrible supply-demand imbalance. Yeah. Very good if you've got these skills. It's very difficult if you're looking for people with these skills. But they don't want to work anywhere. They want to work in a good place with other like-minded people. And if you don't find, if you don't build a culture that's suited to those types of people, then you won't get them. They'll go somewhere else. And is that a culture that, and we will definitely get back to talent in a, in a moment, but is that a culture that has to be uniform across, um, I mean, Man Group has lots of different units, and you have GLG, which is discretionary. Is that something that has to go across all of them, or each unit has to have its own specific culture to retain? Well, I think we've tried to slowly flatten, although it is certainly true that discretionary marriages and systematic marriages are different. You know, they, they just sort of... They come at problems from a different perspective. That's a good thing, I think, rather than a bad thing. But I think an environment that is good for, for example, if you want to hire the best machine learning people, having an environment where everyone's yelling at each other, that's generally not the sort of place that they would warm to. Right. Um, having an environment where, for example, you have weekly seminars on, on, on detailed topics of new research, they would value that, even if it wasn't relevant to the research that they were doing. Or having a an, an office full of bits of interesting technology, which really they'd quite like to buy and have at home, but they can't quite afford. That makes it a better place to work. It's all and, about the and those <laughs> might sound like sort of small things. They actually make a lot of difference. Right. Heidi, do you have anything? To I, I couldn't agree with, with Sandy more. I think one of our biggest investments um, that we've made is in preserving the culture that started you know, the firm three decades ago. But of course, that, ha that culture has to evolve and adapt and innovate at the same time. But at the root of it, it really is about collaboration, a flat hierarchical structure. If you walked around our office, you would have no idea who was the CIO versus the CEO versus the head of trading. Um, and it's that real collaboration and partnership that matters. We've actually adopted a little bit from Silicon Valley in terms of our working environment in introducing agile working. And, and by that, I don't necessarily just mean open environment, but rather working in scrum teams that are smaller cross-functional groups. You're tackling whether it's a new data set, a new insight, with very short-term burst, failing quickly, moving on, you know, really reassessing the value of an opportunity as it moves along the food chain. Um, so that's a, a new thing that we've done that's really helped with the technology um, teams and their engagement with research and portfolio management. And that's an adoption of how they used to function on Sil in Silicon Valley and how they would develop. Yes. The things that they Some do of these there. projects are quite large, and they <laughs> right. take a long time to integrate new data sets and you know, really work with them. And so you can tackle them as one big, large project with a project manager, or you can break it down into incremental pieces and really describe what you think the business value is, continually test that pivot if you need to. Um, but that collaboration between research and portfolio management and technology is absolutely critical. We view them almost as one unit. And I, and I would agree also with Sandy's other comment in that um, you can bring in new data sets and integrate new data ideas or bring quant into fundamental. But if you're not 
a data-driven thinker, you know, uh, looking for sort of scientific proof for your ideas and thinking along that process, then sometimes it's a little bit harder to adopt decision-making based on data if that's not really your foundation. And in terms of um, teams, uh, we, we were speaking earlier, can you have a machine learning team that's three people? Is that legitimate? Depends how good they are. Um, I mean, Possible. I think you can. Um, you how know, much do you have to, to really compete? Do you have to well, really build? Well, I, I think that the, the reality is that machine learning has lots of sub-branches uh, in it. And so if you want to do um, natural language processing, for example, that is a sub-branch which has particular as areas of expertise and has developed quite a lot even in the last two or three years. Um, and has developed very specifically for, uh, for finance uh, in a very different way to uh, natural language processing and other areas. So that type of team would be very different to a team that, um, uh, for example, was trying to spot patterns in price data using any number of techniques, deep forest, random forest, things like that, the deep learning random forest. So, so the whole series, and that's just a different set of skills. So yes, you could have a team of three if they were really focused on one very micro thing. Could you have a team of three just working on their own, surrounded by you know hundreds of people doing something else? I'm not sure why that team of three would want to be there. Uh -huh. um, uh, you know, and and saying that well, we pay them more than other people is actually relatively unconvincing because the the bid for these people is pretty high already, and I'm not sure that money is the only thing that will motivate them to want to work for you. And what about in terms of machine learning, just briefly? Do you have an opinion on whether that's a fad um, or if there's something really concrete behind it? Um, so it, it's certainly the word of the moment, isn't it? You know, if you, um, you, know, if you want to raise assets quick for a fund, call it a machine, a machine learning, learning fund. <laughs> and, um, um, or indeed, if you want to get a journalist's attention, say that you use a lot of machine learning and it, it works really well, I've noticed. But um, so there's, there's definitely a lot of hype out there. And... Um, and there's absolutely no way that everybody that's claiming that they're doing lots of machine learning actually is. Um, there's just not enough people with the skill set to be able to do it. And you're in competition for hiring people with everything from supermarkets to airlines to technology companies to everybody. Um, that all said, what isn't a fad is the growth of data, um, the uh, growth of processing power, and the reduced costs of storage of the data. And those things are all enabling things to, um, to helping find patterns in uh, data. But are the results, um, you know, sort of, uh, I is there a place for a pure machine learning fund today? No, I don't think there is. I think it's a technique that you use on data rather than um, a thing in itself. It's not, a, it's not a fund category or something like that. And there is definitely a lot of hype at the moment around it. And how, how are you using machine learning or will be expanding your use of machine learning in, in, the, in the time to come? Well, I think, I think it's, it's all over the place. And um, the, you know, when I start with one of the sort of most straightforward ways, which is execution, you know, how do you decide whether you're going to send a trade to one broker or another broker or a third broker? Well, what most firms do is they have a head of trading and they build relationships with these firms and they try and work out which firm does a better job. Um, but realistically, if you're running a reasonable sized business and executing with all these firms, you're getting either millions or maybe tens of millions of data points back every day from every firm. Mm -hmm. And most people get that data and they put it in the compliance database and that's where it sits. And there's information in that. So you can use machine learning techniques to work out which brokers give you better execution for executing particular types of securities or in executing in particular types of markets or with particular types of alpha profiles. And that is, that's actually a relatively straightforward machine learning mm -hmm. um, uh, problem. Uh, reading text documents, that's a bit harder. And it's evolved quite a lot, and I don't think it's you know it's not got to the final stage um, yet. Finding patterns in price data, um, that again is evolving. But you know, I, I suspect that in ten years' time, we we'll look back and say, "Gosh, that was really basic what those people were doing <laughs> um, in 2018." And they thought they were sophisticated. Oh my goodness, you know, they knew nothing. But right now, we feel quite sophisticated about it. So, um, so finding patterns in price data. Um, and then uh, fundamental data, again, there are techniques you can use which probably slightly less advanced than it is in some of the, uh, some of the other um, areas. So there are lots of different avenues. Some of them are actually very concrete. 
Um, some of them are still, I'd say, more exploratory. But the one that's concrete, like for pricing, is that something? That, can you can you tell us a little bit, like what percentage of your executions are now being done by machine learning, or will be, or? Um, well, nearly all of our equity executions are done by machines. Nearly all of our futures and nearly all of our currencies, but it, we haven't. Um, I, I'm told that uh, you can now get. Uh, is either a Google or an Apple app to make a restaurant reservation, have a conversation uh, with the <laughs> restaurant for you. We have not entrusted our machines to execute OTC trades that way yet. You know, that, that's, I think, for the future. <laughs> they have better personalities. Yeah. Um, and so going back to data a bit, what, what do both of you uh, feel? I mean, there's a lot of data out there, and everyone's always trying to pitch um, a new data set. And existing data sets that you already have become obsolete within a few weeks. Can you talk a little bit about what are the types of data that, t for you, really you believe provide actual alpha versus ones that are just not worth the time to to look into? You know, there's an analogy out there that you know data is the new oil, and you know some of these machine learning and other technologies are the new combustion engine. And you know, as with all analogies, there's some practical limitations in that. I think you know data is certainly not as scarce as, as oil is, but um, but where it does hold true is that you know you do need to refine data in order to extract its value and to turn data into information and then into into insights. And then equally to, to Sandy's point, you can't just put any oil in any kind of engine. You need to apply the right types of techniques to the to the right types of data. So. Um, having said that, you're right, there's almost a limitless <laughs> data set out there that we could potentially look at, and they're you know, all over the place in terms of ideas, and some of them sound very, very exciting. I think for us, we really you know, approach it with you know, two mindsets. One, do we think sort of ex, ex ante with, with an empirical view that this could add value? Um, to our client outcomes, and that's really, really critical because it can sound very exciting, but if ultimately it doesn't create a benefit for our clients and it d doesn't have any use for us. And then secondly is, is a practical one. Can we, what kind of data is it, what's the quality, can we you know, integrate it and bring it into our investment process in, in the right way? So we're testing a number of, di of different ideas, or some around um, sediment that have been kind of interesting. Really, the biggest area of uh, data interest and investment for us has been on the ESG mm -hmm. uh, dimension. And can you talk a little bit about that? Where is there an edge in ESG data? Well, we are, you know, obviously fundamental investors. Uh, maybe that's not so obvious because we're quant, but we use quantitative um, applications to fundamental investing. So we really want to understand at the heart of it what, how a company's fundamentals are evolving and how that might impact a company's stock price over time. We are, have become, over research and a lot of work over the past several years, very strong believers that ESG information is very complementary to traditional financial analysis. In, in the end, it just gives us a more comprehensive view of the companies that we invest in as potential investments. And I think there is you know, no doubt that companies are facing threats and potentially even opportunities uh, given things that are happening along the dimensions of environmental, social, and governance. And, so Rosenberg actually took a decision to integrate ESG across all of our strategies uh, earlier this year. Um, and for us, it's really about creating that more holistic picture of a company. Now, we're very early for quants because quants uh, typically like to backtest their way into confidence. And in this regard, I would say we're investors first and quants second. But we do think there's you know, rapidly growing amounts of information out there, and this is where our judgment and you know, intellect applied to data sets can refine and extract them in a way that, that makes sense. I mean, arguably, the biggest areas have been on carbon, water. Uh, we've done some uh, information on governance and its impact on profitability. So we're really looking for the fundamental link more than anything else. Sandy. But, the, but the, I think the difficult thing um, with uh, ESG data is if you take the two big data providers, um, which are uh, Sustainalytics and MSCI, yeah then the uh, correlation between scores from one provider versus the other provider for what appears to be the same thing, about zero. Um, and They're that's very not very encouraging yeah. <laughs> because, you, you know, you, the, the, so the data quality, ESG is an interesting area in that uh, clearly there's a significant portion of our clients that want us to invest 
in a much more sustainable fashion in the past. But then the data quality is actually one of the most difficult data quality areas um, to, uh, to deal in. And it's very hard to work out exactly what you do with it. Do you say a company is a bad company because both of the two dominant providers say it's a bad company or one of them? Or there's no easy answer to, to those um, sorts of problems. And I think that actually sort of comes a little bit to the general uh, root of the problem with data, which is that uh, you know, there's all this exciting about excitement about new sources of data, and most of the new sources of data are garbage. Um, you get these wonderful charts of the growth of data and this massive growth. Most of the growth of data is actually in videos. Um, and I don't know if you've looked at YouTube recently, but quite a lot of them don't seem to have a lot of particularly useful content um, in them. So, um, and, then, and then many of the other data sources that you get um, are either very specific. What we found is that many of the new data sources are very consumer sector orientated. So there's plenty of people that will come and offer to sell you for extremely high prices data from a particular app which many consumers have been using to make purchasing decisions um, or uh, location data for where consumers are or things like that. Um, but in the end, um, even if it or credit card data is a, a very popular one, but but the consumer sector is one of many sectors, and you've actually got a relative lack of data in um, in other sectors in relative terms. So I still, I, I think it comes back to this point. I think in ten years' time we'll say, well, this was all interesting that people were getting excited about this in 2018, but it wasn't very advanced by uh, 2028 standards. Well, if um, I know you probably don't want to tell us all what your favorite data set is, but um, <laughs> could you tell us a little bit about what are the characteristics that you look for in a, in a data set that you believe would provide um, value? Well, my favorite data set is Bloomberg, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of data. <laughs> that's a lot of data. That's right. There's a lot of data. Well, I'll tell you, but actually, I will sort of answer your question. Um, the, so one of the things that um, that is very good about a platform like the Bloomberg platform is that uh, the data is very easy to load in. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I was, I started my career as a quant analyst and I would explore new data sets and people would send me a, a flat file of data, they'd send me some sort of legal agreement I had to sign and a manual to try and understand this data. And, um, and the whole process would take weeks or months. Loading in the data took a long time. Um, it was horribly inefficient. Well, guess what? 25 years later, it is equally inefficient. The process of exploring a new data set, the worst bit of it generally is not the price tag with the data set. It's the loading it in. So 98% um, is presentation for you, that it has to actually be easy to... Well, well no, just understanding <laughs> what it is. You know, that's, uh, so so the, you know, the nice thing about Bloomberg is actually that bit is, is very... Um, a quick, the, the downside to Bloomberg data is everyone else seems to have it also. So, you know, that you've got less of an edge saying that you, um, you discovered something. So I think what we have found is that, particularly being a quant and a discretionary firm, that we are increasingly seeing data sets that maybe five years ago were viewed as something that was very special that a discretionary manager knew and that quant sort of didn't have access to. And increasingly, there are data sets which are taking that knowledge and putting it, making it more broadly available. And actually, what we now have, so supply chains, for example. If you really understood supply chains five years ago, you could have a pretty good career um, as an analyst in a particular equity sector. Today, we have supply chain data for every company globally. Um, and sure, the humans can do it a bit better than the machines can, but they can't do it as broadly. Or, you know, earnings calls, as we talked about. People do read better than machines, but machines are starting to read pretty well. Um, and uh, they're relatively unbiased, and they read awfully quickly, and humans read you know, incredibly slowly. So there are a whole series of areas like that, which were the edge of the human. And I, I would say that they're becoming less of an edge unless that human knows how to effectively sort of use that process data in a tool. Um, and that, that's <coughs> how the human survives this. So, okay, speaking on how the human survives this, um, so do, do you have thoughts on whether discretionary managers can actually end up competing with machines or will technology ultimately displace them or do they have to embrace it? What are your, what are your thoughts on? So, so I, um, you know, I, I sort of hate when people do quant versus discretionary as if it's some sort of war between the two. Um, the first thing is I, I, I challenge you to find a discretionary manager that isn't using lots of technology. Yeah, I mean, but we have forty some percent of this room doesn't <laughs> is well, behind the curve. Maybe, but you know, <laughs> but everyone will have some sort of risk system. Some, everybody will have some sort of execution system. Most people will have some sort of screening um, type technologies. Um, 
they may well have some sort of database technologies for storing fundamental data and research and things like that. So there's actually quite a lot of technology in discretionary businesses mm -hmm. um, today. And my view is that actually the real difference between quant and discretionary is that the quants generally are happy to delegate more to the machines than the humans are. Um, Where's the edge for humans? There's a couple of different areas, I think. One is um, there are definitely some parts of the market that are just, you know, we're not going to have machines trading loans for a long, long time. Loans right. are extremely unique and specific. And, um, and indeed, you know, uh, corporate bonds are, uh, I'd say, difficult, although not as difficult. Um, so I, I think that would be one area. The, the second place, I think, for humans is, you know, you can either sort of fight this Right. I mean, so I, I live in London, and um, and the black cabs in London all went on strike and um, blocked the streets in protest against Uber. Well, it didn't work, right? And it's not going to stop Uber coming um, to London. Um, or, or you can try and work out how you're going to take advantage of this. And so the smarter discretion managers are going to say, okay, how can I use these tools to become a better um, discretion manager than I was uh, before? And, and that's how you know the human continues to do very well out of uh, out of technology. Yeah, we sort of leapfrogged that whole discretionary um, versus quant process. You know, when we started the business, it was all about modeling exactly what a fundamental analyst would do, but using the power of technology to expand the breadth and depth of our research so that we can do that detailed level financial statement analysis across 20,000 companies. Um, and so we've been sort of, that's been our commitment from day one. So we've always been in this very cohesive, happy sort of marriage between technology and judgment. And I don't see judgment going away. I just see it kind of climbing to higher order and more higher order um, aspects of asset management. In particular, given our fiduciary role vis-a-vis um, -vis asset owners, we need to be able to explain what's happening in terms of whether it's algorithms that are, we're using, why is it making the decisions that it's making, um, as well as you know face off with regulators in terms of how we're managing clients' assets. And so I think that there is a symbiotic relationship there that always you know, really needs to persist. And at the end of the day, you know, even with new technologies and new data sets, they have their limitations. You need to be able to explain why the model is doing what it's doing. You need to understand whether the data sets that you're bringing in have biases associated to them, you know, either in the way that they're gathered, the way that they're structured, their time frame. You know, so on and so forth. And these are all things that require some element of, of human judgment. Again, if it climbs up the pecking order, sure. Does it disappear together? I don't think so. Not for asset management. So that's actually a place I might disagree on the, on the you, you need to be able we to agreed explain. We agree we're not going to disagree. Yeah, I know. No, I, I, I'm generally disagreeable. So the, um, um, you need to be able to explain, I, I think, is a sort of very human thing. People want um, you to be able to explain what your models do. But when you get into machine learning algorithms, it is generally actually quite hard to explain yeah. what they do. You know, the traditional quant started off saying, I've got a data set and I've got this pattern I'm going to look for in this data set and I'm going to see if I can find it. And if I can't, maybe I'll look for another pattern or maybe I'll give up. Machine learning, you give it a data set and you say, you find the pattern. Right. And you give, you know, you obviously specify some areas of it, but you specify much less. And so I think the, it, it gives sort of human comfort to be able to explain the decision in words. But I'm not sure whether, you know, is that meaningful, that human comfort? Or does it just sort of make people feel happier about yeah, it? Yeah, well, I it's, think there's two aspects. That I think one, we, we don't, um, Rosenberg, we're looking at fundamentals. So we don't look for patterns. So maybe that's not, pretend, that's not a particular area of issue for us. But for example, we've been using, looking at using some machine learning and just deployed that in one of our strategies to manage sort of, what we view potential, you know, torpedo stocks that are going to go on to really disappoint. And we tested against some more, I guess, traditional screening approaches that we had. And the way that we were trying to validate what the machine learning tool was doing was to create uh, different models alongside of it to test it or to cre create visualization tools that allow us to, in part, try to figure out what it's doing. Because you're right, you, you do trade transparency for opacity when you're, you're bringing in machine learning and those types of techniques. But I also feel that in our environment, if a client comes to you and asks why your performance is the way it is, um, you know, it'd be like an insurance company asking why a self-driving car would have you know, made a hard stop at that you know, point in time when it shouldn't have. And I don't think it's sufficient necessarily to say, well, it was programmed with these codes and this module, and I'm not sure exactly what went wrong, but it just stopped. 
So, I, you know, similarly in our portfolios, I don't think we can just say, well, that bit was the machine learning bit, and it just, you know, it's very hard to disentangle that. And so I can't really tell you why your performance took a deep dive unexpectedly over a week's period of time. So I think there is a little bit of responsibility that we have to do what we can to um, explain performance, and that's where I think there'll be a little bit of a limitation in the degree to which you can employ these tools. Um, one last question before we wrap up. Um, Sandy, when you talked about culture being the most important thing that you've invested in other than human talent and how you need to retain these really well-bid people. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit, just briefly, what are the types of things, is it now about everyone being really mindful of work-life balance and giving them all the, you know, work from home and bring your dog and all those types of things? Or is it really about giving them the toys that they like the most? And what, what yeah, a dogs is difficult because some people are allergic to them. And, you, know, you bring your dog in and other people get upset by the dog or not everybody likes them. Um, I, I do think that, um, that the workplace is changing. Um, I can tell you one thing we did, um, I, I think we announced about three weeks ago, so we um, have equal maternity and paternity leave. Um, in a quant culture, it does tend to be relatively male dominated How many today. Months? Um, it's calculated in weeks. This is, uh, <laughs> but it's um, it's about five. Okay. Wow. Right. Okay. So um, that's I, I'm told coming soon to the U.S. Is that right? Very European. Yeah, to do very that. European. Yeah, very nice. um, but that actually makes a lot of difference. I would say that um, uh, you know if you look at our office, you might think it was closer to a laboratory, um, and uh, we have musical instruments lying around. We have language lessons going on, not just computer language lessons, but also. Um, uh, spoken language lessons. Um, we have a lot of visualization technologies, enormous monitors like um, this one behind us showing what's going on in the trading flow. Um, we have interesting bits of technology lying around for people to play with. Um, and a lot of that is uh, trying to create an environment where people feel they can be um, creative with technology. And I think that just the shape and the layout of the place looks much different to what a traditional fund manager um, would uh, would look like and, 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 and how it feels. And I think we will carry on evolving that way as well. Um, remote working, we do some of. I think it, it sort of, it, 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 it suits some bits of the firm better than other bits of the firm. Um, but, um, but, but making a place feel that it's more um, I suppose more focused on what the individual can do, and as Heidi says, you know, we we don't really have offices, and and we don't, you, you can't really see sort of, you know, I mean, you can see who's got more grey hair or who's got <laughs> less of it or that sort of thing, but you can't really, but you know, you can try and inform yourself from that perspective, but it doesn't tell you that much right. about who does what. Uh, we don't have technologists sitting in one corner and portfolio managers sitting in another corner. You couldn't tell who's a portfolio manager and a technologist. Uh, we have plans for a junior. Uh, discretionary um, analyst to learn to code. Um, I, th the moment they do all their stuff in Excel, um, Excel is is a glorified notebook in my view. It's um, it's quite a good notebook. It's better than the paper notebooks I see some people in the audience holding. But but it's still a notebook, right. and you wouldn't run a business through a notebook. Right. Um, so um, there's a whole bunch of ways where I think we're trying to make technology easier um, for people to use and a bit more sort of not like something that somebody else does, but something that everybody does. Right. All right, well, thank you both so much um, for the thoughtful conversation. We're going to go take a break now, and uh, please be back here at 3.20 for the next panel. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you so much.